Well, thank you, Grant, uh, for that very nice introduction. And uh, hello, Texas. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, everyone's awake. Good. The coffee's kicked in. Good to see you. Uh, it's really terrific to be here at uh, TA 2012, TIA 2012. It's also fun to return to Grapevine, Texas, uh, bringing me, me back to my uh, family's Texan uh, roots. And for those of you who missed uh, last year's talk by Bill Tate, the uh, mayor of Grapevine, you missed some classic and unforgettable Texas humor. So I hope uh, everyone is having a uh, great uh, TIA 2012 show and that you're inking lots of deals. Yes? A few of you? Maybe? Ah, oh, well, this actually feeds right into the topic of my speech. Uh, America's economy, as well, as well as the world's marketplace, needs you to succeed. As the makers and vendors of the complex equipment that literally makes communications networks work, if you're prospering, it probably means that the international communications economy is prospering as well. Increasingly, it is your equipment on which global commerce rides. But unfortunately, international news stories are telling us that the world economy is in for yet another possible contraction. In fact, Monday's Wall Street Journal led with the following headline. Investors brace for slowdown. Pressure builds for action by policymakers as global economic worries deepen. Investors are spooked and are keeping their money on the sidelines until government policies create a reliably business-friendly climate. None of the world's major economies seem to be immune from this latest recessionary contagion. Now, America's economic growth has slowed to a near standstill, with leading indicators looking increasingly pessimistic. Unemployment and underemployment are higher. Purchasing is slowing, as I could tell by the lack of the show of hands here in the room. And the equity markets are frightened. Whether it is here, Europe, or elsewhere, Government actions to borrow and print money while expanding the reach of regulations are shrinking economies. This trend must be reversed. If not, we could find ourselves wandering through a lost global decade. Of course, these larger economic and regulatory trends are affecting telecom capital expenditures. It is troubling that American telecom capex has been flat for the past two years. It has been stuck at $66 billion per year since 2010. I'm sure that TIA's members would like to see policies adopted that would make that figure spike upward. Time and again, however, business leaders tell me that policies that grow government instead of the private sector are inhibiting investment. Overall, they say that increased regulation, coupled with, with uncertainties over monetary and other government policies, are to blame for flat growth curves. But it doesn't have to be that way. America has a historic opportunity, not only to maintain our leadership in the communications sector, but to increase our lead even further. With almost 24 million Americans either unemployed or underemployed, and that number is on the rise again. Plus a national debt that increases by over $4 billion per day. We cannot afford to make the wrong decisions. We must promote economic growth. Now one person who uh, is not on the unemployment line is my eldest son, Griffin, the, the baseball player you just heard about. Um, so yes, my 12-year-old got a job. Uh, starting last Saturday, he entered the workforce for the first time to become a Little League umpire. And get this, he can earn up to $30 per game. So I know what I'm doing after I leave the FCC some days. I'm gonna go be a Little League umpire. That's a lot of money. Now he pursued this all on his own. And his motivation? He wants to save his money so he can buy an iPad. Like tens of millions of other Americans, virtually his entire communications world is and always has been wireless. In fact, being tethered to a wireline connection 
for anything uh, is at best an annoyance to him and his younger siblings, Mary Shea and Cormac, and at worst, such a scenario is a frustrating relic from a bygone era. But after Griffin umps another 19 games or so, well, actually, it will take much more than that after he discovers the joys of tax withholding, but uh, I'll let him discover that unique pleasure all on his own here in a few days when he gets his first check. But uh, he will have a new device, and he will be consuming spectrum at an even faster clip than before. Now, this chain of events, multiplied by millions of his cohorts, will help grow our economy and increase our competitiveness. But in all seriousness, in scenarios like this, I see great hope for America and the world. Wireless broadband is revolutionizing the human condition like no other technology in history. And America is leading the way as it always has. We have led because long ago we adopted a lightly regulated framework for the wireless sector. One of the brightest rays of hope to strengthen our economy and increase our advantages over international competitors is with, of course, wireless technologies. As America ventures forward, we should keep in mind that we start from a position of strength. For example, the United States has approximately 21% of the world's 3G and 4G subscribers, and approximately 69% of the world's LTE subscribers, even though the United States is home to less than 5% of the world's population. American wireless providers are also investing more in their infrastructure than their international counterparts. In 2011, over $25 billion was invested in the United States wireless infrastructure versus $18.6 billion uh, invested in 15 of the largest European countries combined. Furthermore, the American mobile market enjoys more competition than most international markets. According to the most recent FCC statistics, nine out of 10 American consumers have a choice of at least five wireless service providers. In Europe, that number is around three. As a result, American consumers enjoy lower prices and higher mobile usage rates compared to countries in the European Union. Four cents per minute in the US versus 17 cents generally in the EU. Wireless subscriber usage on average in the United States is often three to seven times more than in some countries. At the same time, American consumers pay at least one third less for their more enhanced wireless services than consumers pay in many other parts of the world. A minimal amount of regulation created the climate for the American private sector to achieve these impressive results. Policymakers throughout this country and elsewhere should keep in mind these important factual snapshots when contemplating the wireless industry's regulatory future. Here are some of the very latest projections from TIA member Cisco. IP traffic per capita will reach 15 gigabytes in 2016, up from four gigabytes per capita last year. And last year, only 6% of consumer internet traffic originated with non-PC devices. By 2016, this number will grow to 19%. Between 2011 and 2016, mobile traffic will grow by 62%. By 2016, it will take one person over six million years to watch the amount of video that will cross global IP networks each month. Does anyone want to volunteer to be that person? You'd get to be six million years old, apparently. But anyway, by, by, by 2016, what that all means is that 1.2 million minutes of video content will cross the internet every Second, as these statistic il statistics illustrate, more powerful 4G networks, sophisticated devices, and complex mobile applications are taxing spectrum availability. Recognizing the need for spectrum to flow towards its highest and best use, in February, Congress passed legislation that some estimate could place up to an additional 
80 megahertz of prime TV broadcast spectrum into American consumers' hands. I congratulate all involved, and I'm eager to get started on implementing the new statute. Given the pressing need to free up spectrum to satisfy seemingly insatiable consumer demand, we must ask, what is happening in the meantime? Is government doing all that it can to put more spectrum into the hands of consumers as quickly as possible? During this process, will policymakers attempt to over-engineer the spectrum marketplace? Unfortunately, Washington, D.C. has been slow to deliver more spectrum for America's frustrated consumers. Against this backdrop, I will discuss four broad initiatives that, if pursued effectively and aggressively, will encourage America's impressive trajectory in mobile broadband deployment and use. First, the FCC should implement the new spectrum law with humility, simplicity, and regulatory restraint. Next, the executive branch should be far more aggressive in identifying and relinquishing for private sector use spectrum held by the federal government. Third, the FCC should do more to encourage a free-flowing secondary spectrum market by completing transaction reviews more quickly and with a minimal amount of conditions. And finally, the FCC should provide local public safety entities the flexibility and certainty necessary to leverage economies of scale by continuing to operate, build, and deploy interoperable LTE networks pursuant to waiver on a case-by-case -case basis. So first, the FCC should implement the new spectrum law with humility, simplicity, and regulatory restraint. As I mentioned previously, as the FCC moves forward to implement uh, incentive auctions, I will work with my colleagues to ensure that our auction rules are minimal and future-proof, allowing for flexible uses in the years to come as technology and markets change. I'm a veteran of the two largest auctions in FCC history, and while I know my colleagues and I will try to do our best, the reality is that this process will be complicated full of surprises and rife with uncertainty. Many variables will affect the final rules. For instance, how many broadcasters will volunteer to participate in an incentive auction? At what prices? Where will they be located? In the most congested markets or in rural areas where spectrum is more abundant anyway? Will the commission receive enough volunteers in the larger markets where the need for additional spectrum is most acute? How will the commission repack those broadcasters that do not participate in an incentive auction? How will repacking implicate our commitments to our neighbors, Canada and Mexico? In order to create greater certainty and thus a higher participation level, I hope that we will implement the law again with humility, simplicity, and restraint. Congress clearly expressed its intent that uh, no entities should be excluded from participating in these auctions. Keeping in mind that overly complex rules governing the C and D blocks of the 700 megahertz auction back in that, with that vote in 2007, that produced several harmful unintended consequences. As we go forward, we should learn from the past and keep new auction rules minimal. Otherwise, the main goals of the new law, putting more bandwidth into the hands of consumers as quickly as possible and maximizing auction revenues, may not be attained. The executive branch should, uh, second point is the executive branch should act more aggressively to identify and relinquish spectrum held by the federal government. As you know, in March, our colleagues at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration NTIA, which is an office within the Department of Commerce, released a report opining on the viability of accommodating commercial wireless broadband in the 1755 to 1850 megahertz band. This report was written as a result of President Obama's June 2010 memorandum entitled Unleashing the Wireless Broadband Revolution. The NTIA report concluded that while it is, it is 
possible to repurpose the 95 megahertz of the band, various agencies allege it would cost about $18 billion and take over 10 years to move current government users off of that spectrum. Now, I thank my friend Larry Strickling and his great team at NTIA for their thoughtful and comprehensive report. They are very dedicated public servants and they deserve our gratitude. That said, the underlying message emanating from the report is disappointing in several regards, primarily because other executive branch agencies did not provide NTIA with sufficient data to support many of the assumptions and conclusions. The thrust of the report seems to indicate that the executive branch is going to resist relinquishing more spectrum. For starters, the report does not discuss how efficiently or more likely inefficiently the federal government uses spectrum. Keep in mind that the federal government occupies about 60% of the best spectrum. Federal users have no incentive to move off of this prime real estate, but do have an incentive to keep the rest of us in the dark about how much it really would cost to move them and how long that task would really take. All too often, inertia rules the day within government bureaucracies. My disappointment with the executive branch in its failure thus far to find a way to liberate more spectrum to auction for uh, private sector uses is further deepened in light of the fact that Congress updated the National Telecommunications and Information Administration Organization Act, which I know all of you have read in great detail, uh, as part of the recent spectrum law to accommodate reimbursing federal spectrum users willing to move. I therefore respectfully reiterate my call for the West Wing of the White House to demand that executive branch agencies redouble their efforts to find spectrum to bring to auction by a date certain. Finally, although I am pleased that NTIA has begun to discuss spectrum sharing in a meaningful way, the term sharing is amorphous. The notion of sharing has not been defined in the context of current deliberations. Over the years, I have consistently encouraged FCC efforts to promote different forms of spectrum sharing, for instance, in the TV white spaces within the 700 megahertz band and in other contexts in the 400 megahertz band and the 5 gigahertz band. At the same time, however, these projects have been complex and very time consuming. Moreover, the operations permitted in these bands are secondary, meaning that they must accept harmful interference from other users and are limited to discrete uses at very low power levels. Before implementing any new spectrum sharing policies, we should analyze how these limited spectrum rights under various sharing scenarios would play out at auction. For instance, would bidders at auction really be interested in situations where federal government users could terminate the connections of private sector customers with little to maybe no notice? Would investors and financiers perceive these restrictions as an attractive value proposition? Would the FCC maximize revenues for the benefit of American taxpayers? These and many, many more questions abound, and we don't have much time to give consumers some constructive answers. So my next point is the FCC should do more to encourage secondary markets for Spectrum. I have long expressed my support, strong support, for thorough but speedy transaction reviews given that delay and uncertainty surrounding the Commission's current processes may have the unintended consequence of chilling investment that could benefit American consumers. This is an issue that has invited congressional scrutiny spanning two decades. So let's walk through just a little bit of history for a second. After the SBC Ameritech merger took 439 days for the FCC to review, and the Bell Atlantic GTE uh, transaction took 623 days, members of Congress introduced a number of proposals to either eliminate FCC merger review authority altogether or to establish a fixed review timetable as short as 60 days. In response to this uh, pressure, 
and early 2000, the Commission established a 180-day merger shot clock. But let's be honest, the term shot clock is a euphemism. While the Commission endeavors to meet its 180-day goal, it is under no obligation, statutory or otherwise, to do so. As a preliminary matter, the clock does not even begin until a public notice is released. And that step alone can take from a couple of weeks to several months after the initial transaction paperwork is filed with the FCC. Moreover, the Commission staff retains the discretion to stop the clock at will and does so frequently. So yes, apparently the FCC has the power to stop time itself. This means that the 180-day goal is rarely, if ever, met for major deals. Now, since 2001, major transactions that received heavy scrutiny and media coverage took an average of 321 days, almost double the goal. The shortest review, Sprint Nextel, just missed the goal at 181 days. The longest were 505 days for XM Sirius, and 429 days for Adelphia Comcast Time Warner. Amazingly, even transactions unwinding or divesting assets took almost as long, if not longer. Even a seemingly pro forma transaction splitting Time Warner and Time Warner Cable, well, that took 243 days. And here's the bottom line. The lack of a fixed timetable increases the Commission's leverage to extract conditions from the merged entity. Effectively, all too often, the parties must pick their poison, either swallow unpalatable conditions or face months of additional review. In the meantime, uncertainty is costly. Being suspended in regulatory limbo strains both the companies and their employees and provides a government-created and therefore artificial competitive advantage for other industry players. By working under this unwieldy, time-consuming, and unpredictable process, the Commission has essentially relegated the secondary market for spectrum transfers to the comparative hearing model of your used to award broadcast licenses back in the old days. Does this construct speed the flow of spectrum to its highest and best use? Does such bureaucratic sclerosis quickly place new spectrum into the hands of consumers as they are demanding? Or are we at a point where not only is the hope of more federal spectrum coming to market dimming, but the federal government is impeding the flow of already licensed spectrum to its highest and best use? If these trends continue, today's consumer frustration may quickly turn to outrage while we lose, out, uh, lose our uh, global lead in wireless. We can and should do better. Now, my last point is the FCC should be flexible when examining public safety waivers. This is important to you as well. So let's talk about the 30 or so jurisdictions awaiting the Commission's decision on pending requests to build advanced public safety networks in the 700 megahertz band. Denying all these waivers as a group because of the new law, uh, the oldest of these waivers, by the way, uh, have been pending for more than two years. So denying them as a group would force these jurisdictions to abandon their respective critical projects, stifle important innovation and growth, and strand hundreds of millions of dollars in investment not to mention countless uh, staff hours. Why? There is no question that the Commission has long had the statutory authority to facilitate early deployment of the public safety broadband network to permit current waiver grantees to continue deployment, as well as to grant authority to additional jurisdictions seeking to start their early deployment. Moreover, the new spectrum law provides the Commission additional flexibility to allow jurisdictions that deploy early to take advantage of partnership opportunities with secondary users, thereby maximizing existing infrastructure and revenue sources for early deployments and the forthcoming nationwide interoperable public safety network. 
common sense dictates that the commission handle these pending requests on a case by case basis rather than dismiss the whole lot out of hand. In my experience, one size fits all policy making in this context rarely works, especially when we are working with jurisdictions that each have unique characteristics. By examining each waiver request individually, we will not delay the deployment of broadband networks to the first responders in these communities. As TIA's members know well, the technology to knit the interoperable network together, should that be necessary, already exists thanks to private sector innovation, much of it in this room. It's not clear to me why the commission would want to stand in the way of early adopters and the beneficial economies of scale completion of these projects will bring to the public safety sphere. I hope that the commission will think twice before wielding a meat cleaver here. So to wrap it up, when governments attempt to conduct social and economic engineering by foisting unnecessarily complicated mandates on the use of spectrum, their efforts frequently backfire. Private sector actors have a difficult enough time trying to predict market trends and satisfy their customers. Governments should not make matters worse for them. If America sticks with what works, a light regulatory framework, especially for the wireless sector, we can restore market confidence and spur new investment, innovation, and job growth while strengthening our global competitiveness. Our future is bright if we make the right decisions. So good luck. Thank you very much for having me and enjoy Texas.